You know, it's human nature to care about belonging to a group and affiliating with a group. And uh, that's really a core motive that people have. And so it's not surprising that people define their affiliation group, their in-group. And then other people are different from that group. And it's kind of a basic human phenomenon that people don't immediately trust people who they think are different from them. So I think the um, reason that groups have a difficult time interacting positively is that the other group is unfamiliar. And the, part of the defi psychological definition of a group is having a shared goal. And so my in-group in any given circumstance is a group of people who share the same goal, they're in the same place at the same time, they have common fate, you know, similarity. And what that means by definition is that my group is different from this other group. And the other group doesn't have the same goals that we have. Now that could be that they have opposing goals, in which case, you know, I feel especially threatened by them. Or it could be they just don't have goals to help me. And so if they're not declared allies, then um, they're going to get in our way. And so my group, you know, has a hard time dealing with them because they're not buying into our values or they're not, they're taking away resources or they're competing. And so I think the fundamental societal feature is whether the groups are sharing values and goals or not. So an example would be um, if you think about uh, new groups of immigrants coming to, say, your neighborhood. So when they come to your neighborhood, it's up close and personal. Um, and so the, we've asked people this, actually, what do you want to know about a new group of people coming to your neighborhood? And they say they want to know whether they're trustworthy and are they going to steal things from me? Are they, um, is it going to be dangerous? Are they going to keep up their property? Um, are they going to take resources away from the town that I live in? And, um, you know, are they going to be noisy and whatever? So these are all ways that you're interdependent with a new group of people coming in. And that, so people want to know, you know, whether these, whether the norms and values and goals are shared. I mean, you could have, they could be irrelevant, they could have no goals with regard to you. But um, when people are dealing with outgroups in society, they think about their interdependence. And there's actually 50 years worth of research on the contact hypothesis, which says if you want groups to get along with each other, then you um, give them a common goal, an equal status in the situation, and then the authority says this is important, and you do something that's, um, that matters to people. So we often say not food, festivals, and flags. You know, it has to be like something, a real interaction that puts both groups on equal footing and for something they care about. And when you need someone else to get something done that you want to get done, you learn about the person because you have to coordinate. And it's amazing how fast people get over their stereotypes when they actually have to work closely with somebody. I mean, it's not like it's overnight, but you know, the 50 or 60 years worth of research on the contact hypothesis fits well with our approach, which is that interdependence predicts whether the group is trustworthy or not. So the single, in American society, the single best um, example of an interdependent organization is the American military, because you have fighting units that are multi-ethnic, and people's lives depend on each other. And with regard to the specific people in their unit, they get over it. Um, because they really need each other to survive and they take that seriously. So in, um, say, traditionally male, in traditionally male jobs, like firefighters and police, when women come in to those jobs, if there's just one or two women and a bunch of guys, um, they may not feel interdependent with these to solo women. And um, they may resent uh, the competition that the, or you know just the women intruding on what's been a kind of comfortable guy culture in some circumstances because they don't feel like they need these people who are new 
um, they'll say, they'll go into a dangerous situation and they'll say, we're right behind you. And then she turns around and there's nobody behind her. She's in there alone. You know, there are limits to this contact. There has to be a critical mass and there has to be equality between the two groups in order for it to work. But in general, it's the best thing we have and the military is a really good example of it. Well, I would say that, you know, the way to overcome these things is to put people on the same team. So interdependence, 50 or 60 years of research on the contact hypothesis suggests that interdependence is very, very important. And what we found in our research is the process that goes on when you're interdependent is that people pay attention to diagnostic information about the other person. So normally, if there's sort of trivial inconsistencies and in an impression you're forming and you're not interdependent, then you say, oh, well, whatever, I'll just go with my expectations or stereotypes. But if you need the person for something, then you pay more attention to things that are surprising and inconsistent with your expectancies and more diagnostic. So we found more attention to those to unexpected information when you're on the same team, um, more dispositional inferences, so people think about it and say, okay, how can this person be both cheerful and crabby? Well, they must be moody. Oh, okay, so they've got a principle to predict the person's behavior. Um, and more recently, we found that um, there's even sort of neurological evidence for this. So the medial prefrontal cortex gets activated in the same, th you know, if you're on the same team and you're looking at somebody uh, and you've got mixed information, some is inconsistent, then the part of the brain that activates when people are um, thinking about other people's minds gets super activated uh, for inconsistent information. So it's really an interesting phenomenon, this meritocracy thing, um, how resilient the belief in meritocracy is. The correlation that we get um, between is this group economically successful and do they have prestigious jobs and then are they competent and assertive and smart? It's 0.9, the correlation. It's like you're measuring the same thing twice. Um, but there is some variation and the, the variation, um, apart from the former Soviet countries that where they're more cynical about that, it co-varies with belief in a just world and uh, system justification. So, you know, it's hard to get up in the morning and go to work if you don't think that your efforts are gonna pay off. And so it's understandable that people would be invested in believing that if they work hard, um, then they'll be successful and so that competence and hard work get rewarded. You know, it does make a an ec political economic system work to have people believe in hard work. But it does also mean that you make attributions to out groups that, um, you know, might not be fair because their circumstances might be such that it's really hard for them to succeed and there are a lot of structural, structural uh, obstacles.